Welcome to our webinar, Bridging Divides in the Workplace, which we are presenting in partnership with the National Week of Conversation. My name is Sarah Bonk, and I am the founder and CEO of Business for America. This session is designed to help people in the business world who are experiencing increasing divisions in the workplace and are seeking solutions to address it. But we also think this information will be useful to those of you in what we call the bridging space, the civil society organizations working to overcome toxic polarization who may wish to engage the businesses in their own communities. Business for America, I want to tell you a little bit about us. We are a nonpartisan, nonprofit business membership organization. That's kind of like a trade organization that works with companies of all sizes, industries, and locations to take action in support of protecting our democratic institutions. And in fact, we only work on the issue of democracy. We don't have a stance on trade and immigration and all these other issues. By focusing on democracy and how our governmental institutions function, it helps us to remain nonpartisan and to engage folks from across the political spectrum. And in the, as the increase in toxic polarization has been leading to greater political instability and dysfunction, it not only threatens our democracy, it also threatens our economic competitiveness and every company's bottom line. Prior to Business for America, I was a businesswoman, including five years at American Electric Power in Ohio and nearly 15 years at Apple in California, where I remain today. So I definitely come at the issue of bridging divides with a business lens. Today, I am thrilled to be joined by our three expert panelists. We're joined by Allison Goldsworthy. She's a lecturer at Stanford University Graduate School of Business and the author of the bestseller, Pulls Apart, Why People Turn Against Each Other and How to Bring Them Together. Kristen Hansen is the executive director of the Civic Health Project and also often the lecturer at Stanford University Graduate School of Business. And Russ Yarrow, he's an advisor at the Dialogue Project at Duke Fuqua School of Business, and he's the CEO and founding partner of Yarrow Consulting. But before we get into the conversation and get to hear from our wonderful panelists, I wanna share a bit about what we know about how businesses are experiencing toxic polarization in American society. So, in a 2022 survey by 538 in collaboration with Ipsos, almost three in 10 Americans named political polarization as a top issue facing the country, trailing only inflation and crime or gun violence. A 2021 Harvard Business Review survey found that conflict is an inescapable part of work life for employees at all levels, with 89% of US respondents from a wide range of companies and industries reporting experiencing conflict, and they spend about 3.5 hours a week on average dealing with it. And a 2020 survey by the Dialogue Project and Morning Consult found that by a nearly two to one margin, Americans said it is now more difficult to have respectful dialogue with those who hold differing views, and that was different than all the other countries surveyed. It was with this backdrop that Business for America undertook a discovery project to research how businesses are experiencing these divides and what they can do about it. So I'm going to zip through a few findings in this research report, but you can find the full report at bfa.us slash bridging. So in terms of our methodology, we took a market research approach. This was a small study and not scientific as the participants were not randomly selected. However, we got a good sample with diverse companies and individuals, and we gathered both qualitative and quantitative data. One of our key findings was that 69% of the individuals we surveyed reported negative effects from political and social divides on their companies, employees, and culture. We asked a lot about what's not working and there certainly was a lot. Here's what we were told. Leaders feel unprepared to message challenging conflict. Managers lack skills to handle conflict directly. The current employee training is ineffective. And on top of all the factors that are exacerbating these divides, anonymous social media platforms that companies have adopted are enabling uncivil dialogue. We also had a good fortune to speak with companies that think things are going pretty well and have found some successes. What worked were clearly defining the inclusive corporate values, consciously creating an inclusive workplace culture, having regular open communication with employees, and developing the leadership and employee skills necessary to, um, to frame that culture and create that inclusivity. In terms of workplace programming, we were looking at the kinds of interventions that that the companies thought might help improve divisions in their workplace. 81% of respondents believe their company's employees would benefit from bridge building training. 56% believe leadership would benefit. And the top metrics 
that uh, they would want to measure it to see if such training were successful were employee psychological safety and a sense of belonging, as well as mutual understanding. So with that, it is time to turn to our panelists and open the dialogue. Um, thank you all for being part of this today. I wanna to start with the 30,000 foot view and talk about why this matters to business. Um, obviously this is important to our society, it's important to our democracy, but why is this a business issue ultimately? Kristen, I wanted to, to throw it to you first. Sure, I'd love to set things up for our conversation today and welcome, thanks to all of you who have joined us uh, in today's event. So I'm Kristen, I'm with Civic Health Project. We work on the issue of uh, deep political and social division in our country. And I'm so delighted that we're gonna be talking today about both challenges and opportunities in workplace settings. Because if you think about it, work is where most of us spend an awful lot of our time. So just in terms of the proportion of our time spent in situations and environments where conflict may erupt, it's really important to look at workplaces as an element of how we address conflict and division in our wider society. Um, now, conflict, differences of opinion, and disagreements at work are natural, but we're going to scope our discussion today a little bit around the notion of not issues and conflicts arising around work topics, what's the best way to get our project done, how do we address our revenue goals, but rather, what happens when some of our wider societal divisions on issues that feel of consequence to us as, as humans, as individuals, bleed into the workplace and create new sources of conflict, new fault lines that may erupt in a work setting. In short, issues that may sit outside the workplace but bleed into the workplace with the opportunity to harm, damage, or impede constructive, healthy working relationships. This is of massive consequence to workplaces because if our workforces are divided along deep social or political fault lines, it can really impact productivity and relationships and even issues like recruitment and retention at work. So we hope that those of you who are in professional settings and in roles where part mm -hmm. of or all of your responsibility is to think about productive work relationships, this is a pretty important topic. That's great. I think that, you know, one thing I'd like to dig into there is that evidence that this affects the bottom line. Um, Allie, I wondered if you could comment a bit on that um, with your research and work that you've done. You know, how does this show up as a business issue and convincing the higher ups that this matters financially? Yeah, um, I agree with everything that Kristen has just said. And thank you for the opportunity to build it. I work with businesses um, around the world in, in both Europe and in the US to try and help them understand how to cope with polarization and how what when can it be healthy and when can it be unhealthy and what effects does it have? So the research shows that actually once you get to quite a polarized place in a workforce, it destroys value. And actually it leads to talent hemorrhaging. So, you know, one piece of work showed about $250 million a year was destroyed for as value for shareholders as sort of the top positions in companies became more limited and where people tended to agree. And that's a, an easier thing to assess in the US than in other places because people will often declare their political affiliation publicly. And once you start getting to that point, um, uh, like actually people tend to recruit in the same mold. They tend to look for people who are like them and who are a fit rather than additive. One of the other pieces of research that was really interesting is it shows that people are much more likely to leave organisations once they get to a place where they are polarised. So actually someone who holds a minority view or relatively minority view within that organisation will feel isolated and not welcome and then they will leave. So the problem becomes exacerbated exacerbated. And often, you know, one of the other points I, I tend to make to leaders is we all like to think that maybe we're not affected by these forces. And there's some really awkward news, which is we are all affected by these forces. And whilst education can help a bit to make you, you know, um, to help respond to them, actually, it doesn't make you impervious to the effects of polarization in your judgment and how that will spill into other places like as, as Kristen said in terms of recruitment or how you pay people or how you look at things and I guess um, that the final point that I would sort of leave people with on on that uh, on that element is 
you know, one of our pieces of research looked at groups who were most likely to be polarizing in the workplace. And what they found was that those polarizers tended to belong to a group that more in common, who do a great segmentation on this, would define as progressive activists. Now, that does not mean that polarizers are a bad thing or progressive activists are a bad thing or the change that they call for is a bad thing at all. But it does mean that there's a group there who often think that they tend to be unifiers and they're bringing about change where things can backfire and they can backfire quite horribly and place a huge challenge for managers and for leadership. Yeah, that's all extremely helpful context in terms of, yeah, how this how this shows up on the ground and why this affects the bottom line if you can't figure out how to get along. Um, Russ, I wanted to ask you a question too, building on this. You've worked with lots of top corporations and you've also worked with the Dialogue Project, so you've got a perspective as, uh, as all these companies are learning things. To what extent uh, is the involvement in these issues driven by pressure from employees or customers or you know, even in society? Where's the, where's the pressure to get involved coming from? That's a really good question. Let me just build a little bit on all the comments that preceded, which I think are excellent, especially all the data. And regarding the uh, impact of polarization on the bottom line or, or the business process, it's very clear that there's a significant impact. Um, I think we all remember a couple of uh, years ago when Coinbase and Basecamp, uh, two tech companies, uh, decided to, how they were going to reduce polarization is tell people you cannot discuss politics at work. Well, guess what? Uh, a significant number of employees left um, Coinbase and 30% of the workforce left Basecamp. Um, so if you try and regulate um, polarization in the workplace by doing away with dialogue, that's probably one of the results. Um, and then, of course, we had a very dramatic example this week with Budweiser. This is more of an external issue, but um, with the advertising campaign that they launched that was uh, focused on the trans community, the transgender community, um, caused a drop in market cap of $6 billion. Uh, so that's not insignificant. Um, there's a, a, a human resources company a few years ago did a survey and found that 87% um, of employees generally are reading political posts on social media at work. And 35% of them felt less productive because of that since the 2016 election. So polarization and, um, and issues that are associated with that definitely have an impact um, on the workplace. Uh, you know, as to the drivers of it, I think it's a mix. I think if you think back 10, maybe 15 years ago, there was seemed to be a clear line or a partition between our private lives and our work lives. Um, that all eroded over the past 10 years. I would say driven to a great extent by social media, but more like the ubiquity of media uh, uh, all, all together. And we don't have that partition anymore. So it's hard to say, the external issues are being drawn in, brought into the workplace because they matter to people. People are investing in them personally and they're bringing them into the workplace. Um, so I, it's, it, it varies, but I think it's, um, sometimes it's hard to draw a line between external and internal drivers of this kind of polarization. And one That's of the great. simplest examples of that, of course, is the fact that if we are connected to our coworkers out <laughs> in social media on any given platform, it is inevitable that we will learn about our coworkers' political and social positions on different right. topics. We will right. form opinions about that. And that becomes part of how we form opinions of coworkers with whom we need to be productive and collegial at work. So right. that, that blurry line now between our, our work lives and our personal lives can be triggered by something as simple as a post on Facebook that we happen to catch from a coworker. Right. One thing I just wanted to pick up on what Russ said, which maybe can be a slightly more optimistic uh, note is that this isn't the first time in our history that you know people have faced polarization coming into workforce. So of course it manifests differently, particularly with social media and the proliferation of media channels. But if you go back to, for example, the 1970s and the pressure that employees at companies like Kodak 
put on, you know, and shareholders and how they use shareholder activism around things like investments in apartheid South Africa, then like this is, you know, which could be quite a divisive topic. Like this is not entirely new. And I think, you know, we can sometimes be in danger of not looking at the lessons that came from that time because, you know, and I've certainly experienced this with some of the organizations I've worked with. They can be uncomfortable periods of history for an organization to think about and to retain an organizational memory. And as a consequence, we're not always great at learning how to either prevent them come about or what we might have learned from them for when the next time something like that happens because there will be polarizing events that that happen that's an inevitable thing that leaders are going to need to deal with and process and the other point I would make sort of looking backwards is historically the workplace has often been a tremendously good place for people to meet people from other walks of life and as polarization is setting in and we're tending to recruit more in our own molds not always but often that's what's happening like that's starting to break down and I'm not sure that that's part of how businesses thought of themselves, you know, even though it was a really important sort of melting pot interaction role they were playing, that wasn't really part of business's identity. And in some ways, that's a shame because it was such a value that they have bought and they could bring again, you know, to the table that's just been under discussed. I'd add one more more dimension to this question, too, of, of why this matters and maybe just punctuate that by describing a bit about who among organizations and workplaces might this topic, this issue matter for the most? And something I'd ask our, our visitors and attendees to reflect on today is the composition of your workforce uh, in terms of not just political orientation, but some of the closely adjacent or related fault lines that can align to political and social differences. Now, this could be about having a workforce that is highly racially diverse. It could be about having a workforce that is geographically highly distributed between, for example, urban and rural areas and how you look at the geographic dimensions of your workforce and also generational. Uh, we know that some of these fault lines and, and rifts on political issues can emerge most strongly in, in workplace environments where there is a uh, kind of a vertical distribution by age and the generational effects that can impact how different uh, different workers in a workforce see different political and social issues. So thinking about the composition of your workforce along those diversity lines and the flip side of that, if you have a workforce that is highly monolithic and you're feeling self-satisfied that you don't have these challenges because everyone in your workforce generally skews a certain way, be very careful because chances are you have some quiet minority of viewpoint, of perspective within your workforce that may be feeling somewhat marginalized or silenced by the predominant set of views that are, that are articulated within that workforce. So whether you are coming from an organization where you know you're coping with a wide degree of demographic diversity or you think you're not. Uh, either way, this is something you really need to pay close attention to. Absolutely. Well, I, that's great. I think this is, you know, we've discussed a lot of the kind of the, the high level, but we're starting to dig into the next section. So it's a very natural segue for us to talk about what businesses are experiencing in the workplace. You know, we see these divides online, on TV, in our politics. But the companies that we have these relationships with don't generally want the public to know about it. So this is part of why this panel is so important because we can talk about what we've seen and anonymize it where appropriate. Um, to talk about these, uh, you know, these internal dynamics. Um, that's something we really thought about putting together this panel because each of you have worked extensively with a variety of businesses, and we can share whatever our NDAs will permit. Um, you know, and in, in our research, you know, at least one of the companies that we spoke to you would think of as having a very strong culture, um, very unified, and they expressed you know, deep concern about some of the things that they were seeing. Um, and they were pretty shocked and deeply concerned about it as well. So based on your experience, what does polarization look like in the workplace? You know, what are the employees and leaders seeing on a day-to-day -day basis? Would love to hear some anecdotes. Russ, I, why don't you go ahead and kick us off in this area? Sure. Um, I can talk about, um, I think, some relevant experience I had working at Chevron, a large oil company, for 10 years with a workforce distributed around the world, a highly diverse workforce. Um, and the, the, there are three things I would highlight at Chevron that kind of alle, uh, uh, alleviated any type of 
I guess, emerging polarization. And they all have to do with uh, culture. Um, just, but just briefly, one is that it's a company that makes uh, large capital investments in very complex engineering projects. And so making the right decisions and how that capital is allocated is very critical. Uh, so Chevron has developed a system that's um, uh, called the decision quality. It's a, it's a discipline that is taught within the company and it's used in a, a many other industries as well. Uh, it's been around for 20, 25 years. You can actually get a black belt in decision quality or decision analysis if you study it long enough. But there are elements of decision quality that are taught. Things like when you come together as a group to make a decision, leave your bias at the door. When you're considering all of the options, make sure you put every option on the table and have a full discussion and dialogue about it. And make sure your discussion is built on facts and data and not just opinion. Um, but at the heart of it is taught a respect for the dialogue process, the conversation, and uh, the group interaction around these very critical decisions. And I, I saw in my experience at Chevron that that kind of approach to a problem, which involves dialogue and listening, active listening, and respect for alternatives and other opinions, kind of um, uh, radiated out into other parts of the company. It created a culture of respect and dialogue. Uh, similarly, Chevron being a, an oil company, there's a great deal of emphasis put on a safety culture and um, is very intense uh, culture around safety. And it even applies to people in an office environment. There's no division between field and office when it comes to safety. So that again created a culture where people are caring for each other, looking out for each other, being mindful of each other at work. And that tended to create more of a dialogue between people and more alignment. Um, and then finally, uh, Chevron puts a great deal of emphasis on DEI and uh, a long time ago created um, diversity business councils, which are embedded in the businesses and take the principles of diversity and equity and inclusion and adapt them for local business cultures and local business units and local operating environments. So the, there are ways that companies can create a culture of dialogue to minimize polarization in the workplace um, through processes that also help uh, business objectives. That's great. It's like sometimes the business processes themselves, optimizing that is helping to create a culture of dialogue. Correct. Versus explicitly coming in and saying, like, we need a dialogue driven culture. Um, Correct. Yeah. Um, Allie, I thought I would ask you next to, to, to dig into this a little bit in terms of, you know, different types of companies. You know, somebody was asking if we're seeing this kind of behavior across all industries. Um, I think we're pretty, pretty sure I can uh, not to put it, words in anybody's mouth, but that we would all say yes. So, you know, companies across the board are experiencing this. Um, what other types of interventions have you seen? What other types of um, you know divisiveness in the workplace? Yeah, so a couple of things that I note, which is one, this tends to be more, or you tend to notice it manifests differently, not to say more, but it manifests differently in B2C environments than in B2B environments, but just because mm. of the nature of the um, work that you are doing and often when people are doing marketing they will talk about people in group terms so actually as we have been in in this conversation so you will identify a particular segment that you are really going for and you'll optimize to try and I don't know get a piece of merchandise let's talk about one one company that we work with that a very well-known global company get a particular piece of merchandise in front of people and for them to buy it and they will you know the comms people in their team will be honing the outlets that they want to talk to based on that often it can be really quite um, forward thinking the work that they are doing trying to include voices that previously maybe have not been as heard as they should have been something I'm totally on board with but if you optimize completely for that group and you don't think about other groups who maybe might not be quite as happy with what's going on or might be suffering relative status loss, then suddenly you can find a backlash emerging. If you don't think about who your messengers are when you are doing that and how you work with it, then organizations can find politics happening to them, particularly in a B2C environment, in a way that they might not have anticipated because they haven't thought about it. So a lot of the work that we will do will get them to think about some of their non-immediate target groups to work from that, 
a caution though about this group thinking is actually it can blind you to nuance and difference between people because one of the characteristics of polarization is you see someone let's say for example eating quinoa and you take a view on all sorts of other things that they might be doing including their political views and that isn't necessarily fair and there is something much more complex in the way that people do segmentation and marketing as a business practice and how they look at it in terms of employee work as well that actually can accidentally catalyze polarization while still being quite an efficient business process in itself and I think that's something that a lot of people in this sector have not entirely got to grips with and I would include myself in that. Mm. Well as a as a resident of San Francisco and enjoyer of quinoa I certainly uh, relate to that remark I wanted to share an anecdote really quickly on that too you know we interviewed a company um, you know, in, in the Bay Area, all their employees are here and folks get along well. They feel like they're really not dealing with a, very much in terms of divisiveness. It's also a company that, you know, mid-sized company, and um, they're very proactive about how they survey the employee uh, sentiment on a variety of workplace issues. And something, a theme that comes up on a regular basis is, hey, like we're not doing a good job of allowing different viewpoints in our work processes. So it was really emblematic of this, this risk. You, you can get along great and think you don't have a divisiveness problem, but that can show up in other areas. Uh, Russ or Kristen, do you have any comments to add to that? I do, I wanted, and maybe this will help point us towards uh, solutions, approaches, things that people can carry away from our panel event today. Let me let me stitch together some things that Russ and Ali were touching on. So we asked, we asked the question, it was asked in the, chat, what kinds of industries uh, do we see where these sorts of things are showing up? And with respect to B2C, that prompted a thought for me, which is, um, Russ talked about the importance of creating a culture of dialogue and a discipline of dialogue. So one thing that uh, folks listening today might think about is when we are thinking about creating atmospheres of diversity, equity, inclusion, some people will add belonging to that concept, DEIB, within a workplace. What must accompany that is a culture of dialogue and the skills, the practice, the, um, the systemization of that within or the institutional, institutionalization of that within your workplace. So think about how dialogue comes alongside the desire to have a workplace that is inclusive, that generates a sense of belonging. It's really hard to create that without uh, the discipline of dialogue. And for, for companies that are B2C, there is both a specific opportunity and challenge here. The challenge is that because you are um, the type of organization that interfaces more directly with your customer base, you are more likely to come up against some of these societal conflicts. Uh, these can show up in call centers in the way that you interact with people in call centers or in retail environments, right? We have many anecdotes and examples of this during COVID of um, retail outlets or coffee shops where conflict emerged around the question of masks, for example, just for example. So when you're interfacing with the broad public like that, you're likely to come up against these societal conflicts even more. Yeah. The opportunity that creates is to orient the development of a culture of dialogue around how you serve your consumers. And those skills can then be carried back and emanate back into how your employees work with each other. So I think we had talked about this a bit earlier. You don't necessarily have to decide to create a culture of dialogue. We're going we're gonna to set up conversations in our workforce and we're going to debate guns or we're going to debate abortion. It doesn't have to be quite that head on. The key is you want to equip your workforce with the skills and practices of how to confront and work through conflict, create that culture of dialogue and, and build the skill set. So you do want to give people something to practice around that is meaty and meaningful, um, but you can make that very aligned to what you're trying to accomplish as a company and in terms of working with your consumers and generating revenue. I think, and I think that's really key that no matter what you do, you make, you try and align it with the business. I think one of the biggest uh, challenges for senior managers around this issue of polarization is how it is impacting employee performance. And I think there's probably a tendency to think that the more you address polarization and allow employees to talk about it in the workplace, 
the less productive they're going to become, it's going to disrupt business. And that's a big challenge for senior managers around this. Um, but I would add, if I could, just um, a little bit about the dialogue project at Duke that we're working on. Uh, I would uh, urge people to go to the website, which I think we've posted here uh, somewhere. And there's a lot of good resources there. Um, there's some good uh, best practices that we've highlighted. For instance, um, um, Allstate has started a program with Aspen Institute called Better Conversations, how to have conversations. And they execute this in civic settings with guided conversations between diverse groups of people. Um, General Mills has started an internal program uh, talking a little bit about what you just mentioned, Kristen, where they bring employees together and have guided conversations around divisive issues. Um, and you, you've all seen the research that when you, and we've all seen the famous Heineken commercial, where you put two people down at a table who have opposing viewpoints and just talk to each other, understand context and experience, it kind of takes away the polarization. Um, so there's some good resources there on the website I urge people to take a look at. So given Russ has brought it up, I think it's probably worth adding an addendum on that Heineken project, which was done in the UK and no surprise given my accent, you know, I have some knowledge of it. Yeah. Um, so people might or might not be familiar with it. I'll stick the a link in the chat, but in essence, it brings two people together who have quite different views and or quite different backgrounds. So like a climate change skeptic or skeptic-ish and someone who's a, a you know, a, not quite an eco warrior to use, you know, part, tabloid terms, but one of them is a, uh, male to female trans person uh, or trans woman and then it's someone who's skeptical about you know and not quite transphobic but certainly approaching towards that space and they ask them to build a project together a bar so they've got something in common a proven way to try and bring people together and then they ask them to talk about difficult issues and um, what actually happened was particularly in the case of that example where there was the woman who had previously been a man um, that uh, actually there was a large protest because because they said, and particularly from people within the campaigns sector, um, saying that um, it was an unreasonable burden for her to bear to be with someone who was borderline hateful to her um, and to try and explain the situation. And that's a very legitimate point to make. Like, how much is it fair to expect the less powerful person, typically in that situation, to explain and to try and bring someone around? But the consequence was that that ad was actually then pulled by Heineken because of the criticism. So five years down the line, the study that Christian was helped involved in demonstrated that that was actually one of the very few interventions that watching it brought people together. And I think we're still at a very early stage about having a discussion about what the responsibility is to individuals in that place you know in the same way that with the ads that got pulled um uh last week like i, I think that there was a trans woman who again was probably hung out to dry with no real support and left on on her own you know like uh, and how do you try and work out as a business what your responsibility is to individuals and what your responsibility is collectively and I don't have a brilliant answer to people for that yet but I also think the marketing and communication sector is um uh, let's say somewhat nascent in its discussion mm. of of how that should happen and you know tends to be full of progressive activists who try and put the brakes on and that can just backfire like and I wish it didn't but it, it can backfire yeah absolutely we've definitely um heard some of that ourselves as we've brought up the, the possibility of different bridging activities, um, sort of pitching those to companies we have relationships with. And, you know, they say, this is great. It's wonderful. We absolutely want to bridge divides, but we don't want to have to ever talk to anybody who's, you know, ultra MAGA or far right wing and, you know, and vice versa. Um, you know, so it is interesting to have folks that are like, yes, this is wonderful, but I don't actually want to talk to people who are that different from me. Um, Kristen, is that something that you've seen also where there's a, that hesitancy to get involved or fear about, you know, some of those legitimate concerns about, you know, how, what might happen when you're put into this kind of a forum? Well, absolutely. And of course, that is what we are more broadly struggling with as a country. We're just having a hard time talking to each other. But this is why I want to make a quick pitch for workplaces and corporate settings, because as hard as this is, I tend to place my most hope for our ability to overcome this in work settings. And here's why. Um, a few reasons. So uh, the first thing that I would, I would emphasize is that it's what I said at the beginning, which is as, as adult humans, 
Here in the U.S., we spend more time at work than just about anywhere else. Now, maybe we spend a comparable time on social media or on our screens, but that just means that workplaces are really the only effective counterweight to how we're spending those significant amounts of time. And so it becomes, by, by definition, an important um, amount of real estate in terms of time for people to be exposed to skill building opportunities that can lead to more constructive interactions, whether in work settings or out of work settings. There's also the fact that work does tend to be where we bring our better selves. And I know that there's been a lot of conversation lately about the idea that we, we want to or we should bring our, our whole selves to work. And perhaps that's some of how we're finding ourselves in a situation where these conflicts are erupting or surfacing in work settings. But it is also true that we tend to be on our best behavior at work because that is where our paycheck comes from. And that provides a good foundation for people to engage constructively and to learn these skills together. And to that end, my third point, my third point is that I strongly believe that as adult citizens here in the U.S., we do need to learn or strengthen skills in uh in bridging across divides. And the subset skills within that are things like active listening, perspective sharing, approaching with openness and intellectual humility. There are a number of skills that we we would probably all acknowledge we need to beef up. And the workplace is one of the few settings in which adults can and do engage in lifelong learning. So I think we need to take advantage of that. It benefits the workplace, but it also has this, um, this outward effect back in wider society. If we can learn how to be better bridgers at work, where we're um, in proximity to people who are different from us, where we're in an environment that we spend a lot of time in and where we're used to acquiring new skills, I think that's our best hope. So uh, like it or not, companies, we're counting on you. We're counting on you to be a place where we up-level the skills of adult citizens here in America to become better bridgers across divides. That, that, that is a great point. And uh, I would, that, I, again, that's, a, I guess that's kind of one of the ultimate objectives of the Dialogue Project at Duke. The Dialogue Project, which I have to give credit to my good, good friend, the great Bob Feldman for creating the Dialogue Project about four or five years ago, uh, but it's now at Duke for, for one reason in particular, which is over time, what we're learning about through the dialogue project and how businesses manage polarization will go into the business curriculum at the school. Um, Mark Benioff did a fascinating podcast with Kara Swisher a few weeks ago, and he talked uh, about Salesforce experience with LGBTQ issues in Indiana when Mike Pence was governor, and he said, we figured out what to do pretty quickly, but we were doing it by the seat of our pants because they don't teach this stuff in business school. So we really, it is incumbent, I think, on us as business people to understand what the skills are. All, all good managers are good at personal conflict resolution. We all, we all know how to mediate an argument or a disagreement between employees or groups. But when you add in social media and the complexity of the political issues we're dealing with today, it makes it much more difficult. So. Kristen, totally agree. We have to um, learn those skills. And I know that Kristen and Allie are bringing this to Stanford as well. And we hear this from some other business schools too. This is now becoming a, a key skill. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess a note of optimism is there's a new course at the uh, GSB that a uh, member faculty that Kristen and I both know has put on. And it's ended up being one of the most popular courses that people can sign up to this quarter. So I think 70 people have signed up, which is uh, like he thought he'd have 20 people interested on how business leaders should deal with polarization and it now has huge interest and yeah. I think that's really reassuring actually that people are recognizing this is an issue that they will need to grapple with and business schools have to try and help fill that need not alone yeah. of course you know and certainly not elite business schools are not going to be alone in solving this problem but it's something uh, that we should be aware of. Well and I think that's actually a good lead into the next question that I have because um, one thing we heard in our research over and over again was leaders have to be bought on board. The key barrier to success in these efforts is if the higher ups are not bought in. So what does it look like to get a some form of bridging effort going in the workplace to, to change the culture? And what does leadership need to look like um, and what level? Um, I want Russ, why don't you kick us off on this one? Well, I think that um, any good leader recognizes the imperative to deal with these issues. And I think, again, as we've discussed throughout this conversation, any good business leader understands the threat to 
business efficiency and productivity and, and employee alignment uh, because of these issues. Uh, so there, but I do think there's a lot of reticence. Um, there's a lot of, uh, I, why do I have to do this? Let's just focus on the business. Um, I think that's more wishful thinking than anything else at this point. Um, businesses exist clearly in a stakeholder ecosystem and business leaders might like to think that they can exist outside of that ecosystem, but they cannot, that we're never going back again. Um, so it's incumbent on uh, uh, business leaders to understand that and learn the skill sets and understand how they can move forward in those kinds of circumstances. Um, one thing I just wanted to pick up from the chat, which has come out there is, you know, that this is a very nascent area of research, actually, you know, and um, people are still learning about what works and what doesn't. And it's so environment specific um, that actually it can be really hard sometimes to learn to take lessons from one place and apply them to the other. I can see in the chat that people have bought up the recent Edelman report, which was put out as part of their trust barometer series, which, you know, helps try and answer that paucity of research that exists on polarization actually on trust in any kind of international comparison thing i would urge and this is my personal view but i would urge people to place great caution on the quality of research that is in that report um, and instead look to work that bonk has done particularly in the us to pick things up and i'm happy to flag other work particularly in europe i think looking at polarization that is not in democracies which is a lot of what they do and where they base their business uh, where they base some of their arguments on is deeply deeply problematic well hey thank you for the plug ali um you know we we think that um you know there is that opportunity to do more research in this area it is it is interesting how it's nascent um we feel like we've been trying to crack this nut of how do you get more businesses involved and it's it's difficult for all the mm -hmm. factors all the reasons that we've outlined here but also so important i think uh, kristen especially highlighted you know why this matters to our society and why business could be such an important vector for creating change in our culture and ultimately you know um, helping to, to heal some of these societal rifts. Uh, it's, a, it's a tall order, right? Um, well, we'd love to um, ask everybody attending, um, if you would, please feel free to add some Q. I have more questions, but if anybody else has questions, please feel free to click the Q&A button and add those there so I don't miss them. Um, we'd love to include your questions as well. But I'm going to turn to the next one, which is to do with really DEI. I think it's one of the key questions. Something we heard over and over again was um, in our research was, you know, we're not sure that the, the interventions that we have right now, the ways we're dealing with our corporate culture is effective. And I think a lot of companies in 2020 with the George, Flo George Floyd protests felt compelled to do something to try to deal with, you know, the difficulty of discussing racial issues and to also increase inclusivity in the workplace. But some of that programming went well and some of it didn't. I see you nodding, Kristen. Um, would love to ask you to get us started on this subject of like, you know, cult corporate culture interventions, like how, what's working, what's not? Uh, I would encourage folks to think about how you define or potentially widening your definition of what DEI means with a real emphasis on inclusion. And earlier I touched on the notion that these societal fault lines can emerge in organizations that are diverse, maybe not in, in just the ways that we traditionally think of DEI, which can be heavily centered around issues of diversity and race and in gender, um, but that we also think about other elements of diversity in our workplace, and they're not always as visible. Um, so geographic diversity, what are the different dimensions of how, um, of the cultural context in which our employees, our workforce sits? Generational diversity. And and the hardest thing to perceive of all, viewpoint diversity, the differences in the ways that we think about things, our different moral underpinnings, our different social perspectives. This isn't something that we put on our resumes, yet they define some of these important differences in our worldviews as, uh, as workers. So DEI as a concept could potentially benefit from considering all these different flavors and elements of diversity and inclusion and, and to surface those in ways that are constructive and skill building in nature, again, really thinking about cultivating that, that culture and discipline of dialogue within the workforce. Um, I know there have been some descriptions of this in the chat, but I, I wanna say that 
companies and organizations don't have to figure this out alone. Uh, the composition of this panel is really intentional in terms of uh, Russ and his affiliation with the Dialogue Project, Ali and her work with Accord, and of course this wider segment of our of our um, social impact landscape, the Listen First Coalition, and the many nonprofit organizations that are working hard to cultivate that that culture of dialogue in wider society. So there are a lot of resources to draw on. Uh, help is there, and uh, please consider all of us to be resources to you and your organizations as you're grappling with some of these questions. I think if it, if I can just come in briefly, Kristen, thank you so much for the lovely pug. Um, you are wonderful. Um, but one thing, one piece of research that I often talk to leaders about is Lindy Greer's work. She was at Stanford and now she's at, at Michigan, which was looking about, you know, how people think of diversity. And when they go into a room, you consider it primarily on the axis that often is most visible to you and that matters. So I can walk into a room and be like, God, there's like 40% of women in here. This is great. This is really diverse. And actually not notice that all of them are white women or women who all come from the same political viewpoint. That's just how our brains tend to do that processing. And clearly there's some pretty inherent flaws in that. And that also happens even if you get, you know, I can walk into a room and be like, oh, this visibly looks really diverse to me. But actually, is it beneath that? How diverse is that? And what is the impact, not just on the bottom line, but we haven't talked too much about, you know, when everybody agrees on stuff, you tend to not get quite as good innovation either. Well, I wanted to turn to some questions here in the chat that I think build on that. Heidi asks around about progressive activists in the workplace and wants to know more. So um, when you're talking to companies that lean progressive and they have this reaction of not the MAGA folks, um, you know, how do we deal with this? How can we still have some productive outcomes there? I'll um, send uh, a link through to some of the research. Some of it's you, the, the best research, best quality research on it is in the UK, but I see no reason why it would not apply out here in the US. So, you know, if you are typically a progressive activist, then often you want to try and bring about change and change policies. And actually where it can backfire is it can make it less likely to make that change happen. Or when you challenge people in a ineffective way, they can end up holding on to the view that they already have more firmly and become less likely to loosen. And I think that's one of the things that can cause it to backfire. If people end up becoming quiet or silent about, you know, uh, things that they are uncertain of or forced into holding a position that, you know, that takes them from a place of saying, I don't know, I'm interested in learning more and they feel threatened and then hold on to a regressive view. That's probably not where a progressive activist would have liked someone to end up. There can, of course, be merit in doing expressive acts in their own sense and protest can be important for that. But, you know, on the whole, that's not always what people want to have as, a, as an outcome. So I guess that's the bit that I am. I'm picking up on um, mm -hmm. and I'll send a link through now for, for that report. It's a couple of years old, but it that still applies, I reckon. That'd be great. You know, I think something we talked about earlier, you know, in preparing for this was that employees are being asked to bring their whole selves to their workplace. And if when they're passionate about a variety of issues, that feels pretty natural to bring those in as well. Kristen, I wonder if you could build on that a bit. Mm -hmm. Boy, <clears throat> so uh, I, I see the question about not the mega folks and uh, I guess I'll go ahead and bring a personal anecdote into this, uh, which was right after the 2016 election. I was still working in the private sector and was at a trade show uh, the week of the election. And a colleague of mine came up to me as we were cleaning up the booth and said, um, I was going to help you clean up, but I guess now that Trump was elected, I don't need to do that um, because that was that was my place. <laughs> And this is kind of, for me, a kind of a glaring example of how people's political orientations can show up. And this was a really important coworker for me, someone who I went on the road with, customer meetings and that sort of thing. What I would say is this, we can't say not that anybody, uh, learning these skills, learning how to engage and, uh, and confront these differences, both for the sake of workforce productivity and how we bring those skills back into um, wider society is fundamental. And uh, the the reality is that no matter how diverse or monolithic your workforce may be as you widen your view of the stakeholder communities whether it's shareholders your board your customers partners that you work with different geographies in which you're operating and doing business the more you can develop those muscles those chops to exercise um uh listening perspective sharing 
open-mindedness, intellectual humility, and genuine curiosity about others and their worldviews, the more successful you will be as an organization and the more, um, the more whole and functional your employees will be both at work and out in, in wider society. So I just really have to urge resisting the temptation to declare uh, any particular segment of your workforce or your customer base to be out of bounds and just keep going away. If I could just add on to that, those, that, those are great comments. I just add on if the, the dialogue project. There's a couple of interesting things that people might find useful on, on the website. One is a panel discussion we did about six months ago with, um, uh, uh, let's see, who was in a panel? Paul Argenti from Tuck, uh, uh, senior leaders from Allstate and Southwest Airlines. Um, and the topic was how do you engage with political activists in the external marketplace, right? How do you make the decision whether or not to engage? And it was interesting because everybody brought forth their own sort of disciplines and checklists and how they sort through all of the issues and arrive at whether or not to engage. And I, I think that you could apply the same principles internally if you have political activists within the company. You ask, start asking the questions, well, how does this align with our business objectives? How does this align with the culture of the company? Um, and second, we did a, a large uh, program at the Page Society about uh, three or four months ago where we simulated um, a public health crisis. And we had a panel that was made up of uh, people role playing. Uh, the CEO was role played by David Taylor, for, or formerly of Procter and Gamble, CEO of Procter and Gamble. We had the former director of the CDC, uh, current uh, senior director of WHO. We had the executive editor of the Atlanta Journal Constitution, and they were asked to respond in real time to simulated developments as this public health crisis unfolded. And a, and a segment of that had to deal with um, employee activism around this issue. And so that was also illustrative of how people deal with those issues in real time. Um, it's a very, fa it's a fascinating program and I encourage people to take a look at it. That's great. Ali, did you want to build on that? Uh, honestly, no. Okay. I was so. processing the other questions and a comment in the chat. So okay. no, I, I don't have anything valuable for ever to add to that. One of the key <laughs> things about polarization is not pretending you know an answer when you don't know it. And I am modeling that right now. I love, I love it. I love it. Well, you know, there were some additional questions too about speaking up on DEI. Somebody asked about when companies speaking up on DEI issues, if they're doing it internally versus publicly, when is it a sales and marketing pitch versus heartfelt? This does, mm -hmm. I think, get a little bit outside of, you know, the bridging space, but <clears throat> it does fit in with, you know, companies speaking out on a variety of issues. Um, I want to start answering it by just noting that, you know, when the companies that we speak to, yes, there's pressure um, often to, to take a stance on certain issues, but there are also people inside those companies who are humans and genuinely care and want to make a difference. Um, would love to hear from the panel about, you know, what does it mean to do this because you care? I want to pass it to Kristen. Yeah. I, I want to take this one, especially so I can say, hi, Michelle. Uh, so that question came from a former colleague of mine. It's great to, to have you on the panel. And uh, I also want to you use Michelle's question to come back to the example of Allstate, because I think it's a really inspirational one. Uh, Russ alluded to the fact that they have supported and also internally adopted a program called Better Arguments. And um, when I have spoken with executives at Allstate, what they have emphasized in terms of how to be aligned between what they say their principles are and then how they live out those principles in action internally and also out in wider society, they always emphasize how much time they have spent as a company on internal values alignment. Now, Allstate has to do this across a workforce that has many of those diversity attributes that we've talked about. So Allstate operates all across the company. They have large and small field organizations, they work in urban and rural areas, red states and blue states, they have agents of all ages and stages of life. And so um, Allstate was a company that was coming up against a lot of these societal fault lines within their workforce. And as those surfaced, they really emphasized a focus on values alignment and engaging all employees, their whole workforce across different levels and different geographies in this question of what do we stand for? You know, what do we stand for 
uh, internally and what do we stand for so strongly that we would bring a point of view out into um, into the public domain right. that we know our employees would stand behind. And I just cannot stress enough how much I personally have taken away from the Allstate example that really thinking about that mix of stakeholders and when you articulate values are these ones that you have developed in congruence with those different stakeholder communities. Of course, your workforce, but more broadly, uh, understanding how and why you would defend those values to your customer base, to your shareholders, to your board, to your partners. So um, really encourage further exploration of how they've done that. That's that's kind of what I would use as an example to respond to Michelle's question. Great. Thank you so much, Kristen. Um, we are going to wrap this up unless Russ or Ali have a quick comment. I was going to say, I'd love to leave people with three very quick tips that we found from our work that can help, you know, leaders better prep for polarization. The first of which is to try and think about including it in employee surveys. And I don't just mean in surveys, in terms of watching their behavior, because in polarized societies, what people feel, how they, um, what they say and how they behave can be very different. And that's a warning sign. A second one is um, for leaders to check out what happens to people who do actually speak out. Came across a really neat example the other day about a leader who deliberately chief exec at a big S&P 500 company who was asking for follow on details on career progression for people who had whistleblown or who had spoken out. So that actually genuinely helps make sure that you value people who think differently and others shouldn't be scared to do that. There's enough dynamics that keep people quiet, like you need to push things in the other direction. And the third one, and this really builds on what Russ was saying in that Chevron example, is have a look at your risk register. You know, how effectively are you predicting where there could be issues and where there will be challenges? Because although it's pretty inevitable that polarization will happen to people and sometimes it will be done to them quite expressly by outside forces, that doesn't mean you can't prepare for it and be in a better place than, for example, Mark Bainoff was talking about with Salesforce and how they responded in Indiana. Like, I would say that actually that was a bit of a corporate governance failure, that they weren't aware of that coming down the track and better prepped for it. I think that's that's perfect. Thank you so much, Ali. In terms of uh, in terms of things folks can do, things they should, should be thinking about that are essential to successful efforts. I'm going to really quickly share a couple thoughts uh, to to bring this home. Um, for for those of you still with us who are wondering, you know, what what. What would you do next? Um, there's, we've shared a lot of resources and it may be hard to know. Uh, Business for America is working to build out our employee development programming on civics and civil dialogue. Those two pieces fit together really neatly for us. So we do invite you to reach out to us. We're also working on legislation that will encourage um, a variety of uh, organizations provide support to organizations working on bridging divides. That's called the Building Civic Bridges Act, federal legislation. And we're also working on a business forum to address what we see as a backlash against workplace inclusivity efforts. Um, sometimes lawmakers and regulators, um, unfortunately, uh, taking aim at businesses that are trying to solve these very problems that we were talking about today. Uh, would love it if you would subscribe to our newsletter. That's where you will hear about these efforts. Um, but you can also get directly in touch with us, info at bfa.us or me personally, bonk at bfa.us. And also, please note, you know, there's a lot more of this. There's a number of our partner organizations and brilliant individuals out there having additional conversations that'll dig into this. Go to conversation.us slash workplaces. Um, just some awesome, awesome stuff. So I really encourage you to go there if you can and um, continue the conversation. Thank you so much to our panelists. Thank you, Russ, Kristen, and Allie. This was a lot of fun and I think valuable for the folks who attended and gonna be a great resource uh, for the future on our YouTube channel. So thank you so much. Thanks everybody for joining us.